<laughs> Dearly beloved, we're gathered here in this beautiful and significant place to um, talk about something unusual. I want to talk about a, a, a movement and, and a heresy, the movement of the free spirit, so-called, the heresy of the free spirit, uh, according to others. Everything turns on the interpretation of the words by St. Paul. Corinthians 2, 3, 17, you know it by heart. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Lord's Spirit is, there is freedom. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Lord's Spirit is, there is freedom. Now there are two ways of interpreting this, this remark of St. Paul. Either the Lord's Spirit is outside the self, or within the self. If the Lord's Spirit is outside the self, because the soul languishes in sin and perdition, then freedom can only come through submitting oneself to divine will and awaiting the saving activity of grace. Such is the conventional teaching of Christianity, which explains the necessity for the authority of the church as that terrestrial location or portal to the Lord's Spirit. But, and this is the key to the, the heresy that I want to talk about this evening, if the Lord's Spirit is within the self, then the soul is free and has no need of the mediation of the church. Indeed, and we'll come back to this, if the Lord's Spirit is within the self, then essentially there's no difference between the soul and God. The heretical Adamites who moved to Bohemia after being expelled from Picardy in the early 15th century, are reported to have begun the Lord's Prayer with the words, Our Father who art within us. If a community participates in the Spirit of God, then it's free and has no need of the agencies of the church, state, law and the police. These are institutions of the unfree world that a community based on the free spirit rejects. There was apparently widespread uh, literature connected with the movement of the free spirit. It was repeatedly seized and destroyed by the Inquisition with relentless efficiency. And very few texts remain. Many of them are apocryphal. But of the few texts, the one that I want to talk about this evening is a text by uh, a woman called Marguerite Porret. And the title is slightly ungrammatical even in French, in, it's written in medieval French. Um, and the title is The Mirror of Simple and Annihilated Souls and Who Remain Only in Wanting and Desire of Love. And this text was only discovered in 1946 by uh, an Italian philologist. This text is an instruction manual of sorts that details the seven stages that the soul has to pass through in order to, that human beings may become divine, overcome original sin, and recover the perfection that belonged to human beings prior to their corruption by the fall. The mirror of simple annihilated souls seems to have circulated in manuscript, uh, in different translations in the medieval period. We know very little about Marguerite Porres, uh, and most of what we know comes from her um, trial, uh, which led to her execution for heresy. She was a learned begin, uh, which was the term that was first used to describe semi-religious women who lived alone or in begin houses or beguinage. And these began to appear in the southern Low Countries in the late 12th and early 13th centuries. And they were effectively experimental uh, communes, um, experimental associations for sisters of the, of the free spirit and their brothers, the beggars, from which we get the, uh, the word beggar. The emphasis on, upon begging is, is hugely important. These people, for the most part, led uh, mendicant lives. They were itinerant and mendicant. And it was a question of imitating the poverty uh, of Christ. 
That's why the interpretation of the poverty of Christ in this period took on such radical political consequences. Her book was seized and uh, publicly burned at Valenciennes, but she refused to retract it. Uh, and when Porette came to the attention of the Inquisition in Paris, she was then imprisoned for 18 months and all that the Inquisition wanted her to do was to uh, retract her views. They didn't want to execute her. Uh, she refused to do that and she was burnt at the stake in 1310. Um, you might imagine that being burnt at the stake is a sort of rather severe punishment, but she was treated with sort of relative liberality in a way. Uh, they didn't want to burn her. They'd been burning people in auto de fe's in previous decades with terrible PR consequences. So they tried to not burn her, but she refused to recant. The, the relative leniency of the way she was treated would suggest that she came from the upper social strata of, um, of society. In this period in, in European history is the emergence of an urban bourgeoisie, which produces two phenomena. It, on the one hand, produces a, a dislocated uh, working class, a dislocated proletariat taken from the country to the city, who are ripe for forms of uh, charismatic and um, apocalyptic Christianity. And on the other hand, it produces um, a leisured bourgeoisie. And the, in particular, the daughters of those leisured bourgeois families tend to be the women that are attracted to the, the Beguine movement and become uh, prominent in what's called so-called mysticism. And scholars of mysticism like uh, Amy Hollywood <clears throat> uh, and poets like Anne Carson have identified Marguerite Porette as a progenitor uh, and a vital precursor to modern feminism. And it's also revealing in, in, a, in the documents we have related to the trial of Porette that she's described in more than one place as a pseudo Moliere, as, as, a, as a fake woman. So much for context. What is the, what is Porette's, uh, what's she up to and why is this, why should this be of any interest to us on the, a night like this? I want to identify the movement of the free spirit by recounting the seven stages of um, what Poet calls the devout soul in chapter 116 of this 139 chapter book. It's a very interesting book, it's a very long book. It's written in the style of a courtly love romance on the one hand, and it owes a great deal to the dialogical style of someone like Boethius. But at the core of the book are a seven stage itinerary of how to become God. And that's what I want to try and uh, explain to you, how to become divine. Step one, the first state occurs when the soul is touched by God's grace and assumes the intention of following all of God's commandments, of becoming obedient to divine law. So the first step in the seven, the seven step process is being obedient to divine law. The second state mounts yet higher and the soul becomes a lover of God over and above commandments and laws. Regardless of any command, the soul wants to do all it can to please its beloved. So in this second state, uh, one thinks here of, of St. Paul's arguments in, in Romans and in, in Galatians, the, uh, we have a move from law to love and a movement from external um, uh, accepting an obligation to an internalization of love. So step one, obedience to the commandment. Step two, uh, overcoming law through love. In the third state, step three, consumed by love for divine perfection, the soul attaches itself to making works of goodness. These can be images, representations, projects and objects that give us delight in glorifying God, Perret insists. The soul, she says, renounces these works, renounces these works in which she has this delight and puts to death the will which had its life from this. So in this third step, we go from uh, an idea of religiosity based in works to something else. 
In this step, the soul no longer wills, but undergoes a detachment from the will by obeying the will of another. The soul must become a martyr, she says. And Porette's language here becomes extremely violent. She says, one must crush oneself, hacking and hewing away at oneself to widen the place in which love will want to be. This is the beginning of the painful process of the annihilation of the soul, where suffering is necessary in order to bore open a space that's wide enough for love to enter in. Step four, when I've renounced my will and hewn away at myself, when I've begun to decreate and annihilate myself, I'm filled with God's love and exalted into delight, she says. And Porette's wording here is extraordinary. The soul does not believe that God has any greater gift to bestow on any soul here below than this love which love for love has poured forth within her. So in this fourth state, having opened up this place where love might want to enter, the soul becomes drunk with love. Gracious love makes her holy drunken, Porette says. Now, little excursus here. Um, in his wonderfully, uh, is it raining? In his wonderfully capacious and open-minded investigation into mysticism, William James discusses the relationship between mystical states and drunkenness. This is what he calls the idea of anaesthetic revelation, which he tries to linked to his own experiments with laughing gas or nitrous oxide, which was the drug of choice amongst scientists, poets and intellectuals throughout the 19th century. Might have been good to get some for this evening, maybe. <laughs> nitrous oxide, James recounts from personal experiences, experience, induces a feeling of reconciliation or oneness at a level deeper than that of ordinary waking consciousness, with its separation of subjects and objects. And James goes further and compares this mystical experience of reconciliation or cosmic consciousness with what he sees as Hegel's pantheism. There is, for James, he says, the monistic insight in which the other in its various forms appears absorbed into the one. On this reading of Hegel, the key to dialectical thinking is the unity of the same and the other where what Hegel calls the concept would be the movement of thinking which grasps both itself and its opposite. And Hegel's, um, James's point is that one can only understand Hegel when drunk, when one is on laughing gas. Right? The truth of Hegel's philosophy only becomes possible in this artificial, uh, mystical state of mind. So that's drunkenness, but drunkenness is always followed by a hangover. And such is the condition of what Porek calls dismay, which is what, if you've read any mystical text, what other mystics will call distress, dereliction, and distance from God. So the error of the fourth state is to believe that the progress of the soul is complete with its beatific union with God. Such a conception of mysticism is common to many mystics and even encouraged by the church. The fifth state is the dismay and dereliction that follows from this drunkenness, which is sober consideration. On the one hand, the soul considers God as the source of things that are, that is of all goodness. But on the other hand, the soul then turns to consider itself from which all things are not. The free will that God put forth into the soul has been corrupted by the fall. In so far as the, full, as the soul wills anything, that thing is evil, for it's nothing but the expression of original sin and the separation from the divine source of goodness. As Porette puts it, quote, the soul's will sees that it cannot progress by itself if it does not separate itself from her own willing, for her nature is evil. So how then can I will not to will? How then can I overcome the will if all of my willing is simply the confirmation of my sinfulness? 
It's the problem that Perret raises. I cannot will not to will, for every act of the will, even the will not to will, is an expression of separation from divine goodness and therefore evil, she insists. As we saw in the third state, the soul has tried to cut away at itself, to bore a hole in itself that will allow love to enter. But the momentary exaltation of the fourth state, drunk with divinity, was illusory and transitory. The fifth state, Perret writes, quote, has subdued her, i.e. the soul. It is here that we face what Perret repeatedly calls an abyss, deep beyond all depths, without compass or end, she says. This abyss is the gap between the willful and errant nature of the soul and divine goodness. It cannot be bridged by any action. In the fifth state, two natures are at war within me, the divine goodness that I love and the evil that I am by virtue of original sin. As Paul puts it, the good that I would I do not, but the evil that I would not that I do. Faced with this abyss, in the fifth state, I become a paradox. The soul wants to annihilate itself and unify with God. But how? In the sobriety of the fifth state, the soul knows two things, divine goodness and the errant activity of the will. In making herself look at herself again, she says, in painful self-scrutiny, Perret adds, that these two things that she sees take away from her will and longing and works of goodness. And so she is wholly at rest and put in possession of a state of free being, the high excellence of which gives her repose from every thing. The reasoning here is delicate. The abyss that separates the soul from God cannot be bissed or bridged through an act of will. On the contrary, it is only through the extinction of the will that the sixth state can be attained. That is, the soul itself becomes an abyss, that is, it becomes emptied and excoriated. But in the sixth state, Porret says, the soul does not see herself at all. Not only that, the soul does not see God. God, of his divine majesty, sees himself in her, and by him, this soul so illumined that she cannot see that anyone exists except only God himself from whom all things are. When the soul has become annihilated and free of all things, then it can be illumined by the presence of God. It's only by reducing myself to nothing that I can join with that divine something. As Perret insists, in this sixth state, the soul is not yet glorified. That is, it's not a direct participant in the glory of God. This only happens after our death in the seventh state. But what happens in the sixth state is even more extraordinary than glory. She says, now, let me quote this at length. This soul, thus pure and illumined, sees neither God nor herself, but God sees himself of himself in her, for her, without her, who, that is God, shows to her that there is nothing except him. And therefore, this soul knows nothing except him, and loves nothing except him, and praises nothing except him, for there is nothing but he. Which means, brothers and sisters, the annihilated soul becomes the place for God's infinite self-reflection. If the soul has become nothing, then it can obviously see neither itself nor God. On the contrary, God enters into the place that I created by hacking and hewing away at myself. But that place is no longer myself. What the soul has created is the space of its own nihilation. This nihil is the place, or better, the no place, as Augustine would say, where God reflects on himself where God sees himself of himself in her. Very strange thought. So the idea here is that when we have annihilated the soul, 
then God fills the space of the annihilated soul in a movement of reflection that is both for her and without her. The only way in which the soul can become for God is by becoming without itself. So love, and very much this is what I'm trying to think about in this, this, uh, this work, love is the audacity of impoverishment, of complete submission, an act of absolute spiritual daring that induces a passivity where the self becomes annihilated. It's a subjective act where the subject extinguishes itself. It's through this annihilation that the soul knows nothing but God and loves nothing except Him. Once the soul is not, God is the being that is. That's the sixth state. And the seventh state is what we experience after our death, of which we'll have no knowledge until our souls have left our bodies, which will be some point in the future, presumably. So there are, those are the seven easy stages you can follow in order to become <laughs> divine. This evening, here and now. <laughs> Why was this condemned as heresy? For the simple reason that once the soul is annihilated, there's nothing to prevent the identity of the soul with God. By following the itinerary of the seven states described in the mirror of simple annihilated souls, the soul is annihilated and I become nothing. And in becoming nothing, God enters the place where my soul was. And at that point, I, whatever sense the first person pronoun still has at that point, I become God. So the thought in Poret of annihilation is that when I become nothing, I become God. In other words, the I that lives is not I, but God. This might also be linked to some of the wilder elements of uh, medieval mysticism. The heresy of the free spirit is not some neoplatonic idea of the union of the soul with the one through contemplation. Rather, what you find in Poret is a passionate desire to surpass the condition of humanity and become God. The path to the sacred or the religious passes through um, bodily experience for someone like Poret. And not just any bodily experience, a bodily experience of suffering and pain. She says she can imagine them, picture them, but that's not enough. She prays to God that she would suffer that passion in her body. Teresa of Avila uh, talks about the piercing of the heart that takes place when she's on fire with the love of God. The pain was so great it made me moan, she says. This desire for annihilation reaches an extreme case of extreme violence against the self, a kind of metaphysical masochism which I find extremely interesting. Angela Foligno writes, there are times when such great anger ensues that I'm scarcely able to stop from totally tearing myself apart. It's about 13, 30 or something. There are also times when I can't hold myself back from striking myself in a horrible way. And sometimes my head and limbs are swollen. It's not difficult to see why the movement of the free spirit posed such a profound threat to the authority of the Catholic Church and the governmental and legislative authority of the various states in which that uh, heresy manifested itself. If it was possible, theoretically, as it were, theologically, religiously, to overcome original sin and to regain the Edenic state of intimacy with the divine, then what possible function might be served by the Catholic Church? The function of the Catholic Church was to act as a mediator between the human and the divine. And that was only justified insofar as human beings travail in the wake of original sin. If that condition can be overcome, 
then the function of the church evaporates. And all forms of ecclesiastical authoritarianism and all forms of governmental authoritarianism linked to ecclesiastical power disappear. Then all conceptions of mine and thine vanish. In the annihilation of the soul in Poret, mine becomes thine, I becomes thou, and the no place of the soul becomes the space of divine reflection. Private property on this understanding is a consequence of the fall. Private property is a consequence of the fall. If we can overcome the condition of our fallenness, then the legitimacy for private property also disappears. So this experience of divinity is not some, um, again, some contemplative idea. It is achieved as a commonwealth of those who are free in spirit in, this, uh, in the movements I'm trying to describe. Private property is just the consequence of our fallen state. The soul's recovery of its natural freedom entails commonality of ownership. The only true owner of property is God, and his wealth is held in common by all creatures without hierarchy or distinctions of class and hereditary privilege. So the political form of the movement of the free spirit is communism. Furthermore, the movement of the free spirit is a communism whose social bond is love. We've seen how Poret describes the work of love as the audacity of the soul's annihilation. Clearly, there can be no higher authority than divine love, which entails that communism on this view would be a political form higher than law, which of course is an argument that Marx repeats many centuries later when Marx tries to imagine communism as a society without law. We might say that law is the juridical form that structures a social order. As such, it's based on the repression of the moment of community. So the function of this argument for the annihilation of the soul, uh, I, I hope to have shown, releases the possibility of a notion of community, which is the core of the idea of mystical anarchism. I mean, the places where... How do you turn this thing off? <laughs> so what I've tried to show in a very sort of bizarre way was that um, is one of those places where forms of uh, forms of community were being imagined uh, around extremely radical and provocative religious ideas. In this case, an idea of uh, the union of the soul with the divine through a process of, of annihilation. What that yields. Uh, it is a certain way of thinking about forms of utopian community. <laughs> this is the strangest thing I've ever done in my life. This is... <laughs>